We're back. We're live at 3 o'clock rock here on a given Wednesday, just a couple of days before the uh, the New Year's. And we're excited to uh, be able to talk to Lou uh, Pugliaresi again from EPRINC, the energy policy think tank in Washington, uh, here on Energy America, Energy in America. And today's show is, is called, let's see, building up to the inauguration, because things are happening that will have an effect on uh, President Obama's departure and the inauguration of President Trump. Uh, so welcome back to the show, your show, Lou. Uh, happy Christmas and prospectively Happy New Year. Same to you, Jay, same to you. <laughs> we don't have any snow yet. We actually have quite balmy weather. <laughs> it's well. coming, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, couple of things we were going to talk about, and I'd like to um, take this part of the show and talk about one of them anyway. And that is the regulations, the, what do you call it, the midnight rules that the uh, White House under President Obama has promulgated. And um, what are they? What effect do they have? And what, what effect will they have on the inauguration? Right. So uh, let's start with, of course, this. Uh, we'll have to try to keep this from being too much inside baseball. But every administration tries to ram through a bunch of regulations at the end. Uh, but... You know, as we discussed previously, Congress has something called the Congressional Review Act, where they can reach back and get some of these regulations. But some are harder to turn over than others. And I thought it was quite interesting, we could spend several hours talking about so many regulations Obama's putting out in so many areas, but he, he issued a one quite recently that sort of stunned everyone. That was about last week, where he said he is now decided to take off the table forever any leasing for oil and gas uh, resources throughout the entire Atlantic Basin, which is the East Coast of the United States, and a large swath of the Arctic offshore Alaska. And the law is kind of complicated, but uh, it, it suggests that it, it talks about how you can ban stuff, but the this, this uh, offshore leasing law does not talk about how you put stuff back in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the Congress, which is controlled by the Republicans, wants to repeal this particular uh, rule or regulation because their vision of the future is that the North American petroleum renaissance and the offshore resource of the U.S. are quite valuable and they will help restore economic growth. So why, why would the president, why would President Obama do that? It just sounds like he's putting a hot coal in Trump's pocket yeah, and no, the Trump I, won't tolerate it and the Congress won't tolerate it. He's, he's going to, he's really making it difficult for, for Trump when he first comes back. On the other hand, he, he, you know, he is like a moth to a flame. The more he does this, the more Trump is going to get animated and try to do something. <laughs> now, I do think that Congress is probably thinking about, at least the, the Republicans in the Senate, they say, okay, it will take us a while to remove these regulations in the Atlantic and in the offshore Arctic. And actually, oil prices are not that high. It would probably take a long time for the oil companies to fix that. We have another problem. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, which moves crude oil from the north part of Alaska, which is Prudhoe Bay, all the way to Valdez, the port, where it's distributed to North America, the Orient, and occasionally to Hawaii. Uh, that, that pipeline, because of the natural decline rate at Prudhoe Bay on the North Slope, has gone from moving 2 million barrels a day to 500,000 barrels a day. So that's a kind of problem because when the pipeline gets to very low volumes, the crude oil essentially freezes. <laughs> it mm. doesn't move. So you need the friction to move it through the pipeline. One possibility in which near-term production could be had in a relatively short period of time is to, instead of trying to repeal this reg right away, through the budget reconciliation process, which does not require 60 votes, but just 51 votes, 
the Senate might try to open up the Alaska Natural Wildlife Reserve. Now, if you've ever been up there, it's really a wasteland, but lots of people view it as a, it's, it, because of its name, a lot of the environmentals, environmental community will go crazy. So I think this is going to be interesting to watch in the new year. So what? So there's going to be a lots of these measures out there. Um, coal exports. A lot of the coal industry is looking for help on coal exports. This means permits from the Corps of Engineers. And as we discussed last week, I'm absolutely positive Trump will reverse the Keystone XL pipeline and the Dakota Access pipeline in the first few days. So there's a long list of these regulations, and it's going to be quite interesting to see how Trump and the Republican Congress moves to repeal them. He's made his position clear, hasn't he? I mean, on climate change and on, on oil and gas and coal, um, is, he, is he going to be able to realize, uh, you know, his, um, his statements of intention on, well, uh, you know, changing things sort of back to fossil fuel? Well, I don't think entirely, of course, because there's some realities we ought to talk about. First, anybody who thinks he's sort of one-dimensional on this has to look at his cabinet, because he has cabinet officers, appointments, who have much different views on the world. Russia even has, Tillerson, you could argue, is his pro-climate guy, <laughs> even though he's the former head of ExxonMobil. He's the only one who's pushed for a carbon tax. <laughs> or has said that climate is a problem we should worry about. So I think that's interesting. So I, I don't know how that's going to work out. But I think, uh, first, as we talked last week, I mean, the states are still driving a lot of the process. And today, today or yesterday, John Kasich, the governor of Ohio, uh, went ahead and vetoed a bill from his own Republican legislature in the state of Ohio, which tried to repeal the Renewable Portfolio Standard for Ohio. And he said, no, we kind of need that. It's good for jobs and advancing the technology. So I'm going to veto that bill. And I, I don't know if you've seen Jerry Brown. He is now uh, making clear that, that California plans to engage, negotiate directly with other countries on climate strategy. Interesting. So, this is this is all a backlash on Trump's remarks. Right. <laughs> well, in terms of other countries, you know, I wonder how Trump's um, you know return to focus on oil, gas, and coal um, is going to work. Uh, for example, um, he hasn't made friends with China, and, and in fact, you know, there's a there's a widening gap there because of his tweets and remarks. And China is a, um, a customer, isn't it, of American coal and, and fossil fuels? Actually, China buys, I think, some metallurgical coal from the U.S. Not that much. Mm -hmm. you know, Australia is the probably Australia, maybe some Indian coal makes its way to China. Although American coal exports could be competitive in the Pacific Rim mm -hmm. uh, by knocking out more expensive and actually more envi environmentally harmful uh, coal supplies, particularly the way they're mined in India. Whether that's possible, we'll have to see. So sure. I, I do think, you know, about China, and I don't know what's inside Trump's head on this, but I think on China the interesting issue is people come found soot and air pollution with climate. But, you know, all, all coal-fired power plants in China come with what's called scrubbers, hydroelectric scrubbers, and these scrubbers can remove the particulates. The Chinese just choose not to run the scrubbers because they <laughs> hurt Save the money. efficiency of the power plants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's cute. So there is a, but there is a slow, a building public, uh, you know, backlash, if you like, or concern over smog in China. Yeah, oh, sure. People walk yeah. around with gas masks. And I, I do think Trump's, you know, the question is, was he like just a, a lunatic and, and started talking to Taiwan, or was this a planned initiative? I, I think it might have been planned to just, in, just tell China, well, you know, you're doing X and Y out there in the Spratly Islands, I mean, building out these reefs. Uh, 
we have a couple of counter moves we're prepared to make. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of like Richard Nixon's strategy. I might be crazy, but you'll have to wait and see. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much Trump's line, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, what, uh, what's interesting is uh, I, I, don't, I don't think he realizes that uh, he may not be able to win these games so easily. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention, and something you said a minute ago suggested that um, you know, you think these tweets at 2 o'clock in the morning are um, totally accidental? Um, you know, I don't think so. I, I used to think so. I think public in general must think that tweets at 2 o'clock in the morning are spontaneous. But I think, no, he's a businessman and he's going to have a plan about this and he's trying to affect public opinion and it's, it's all very choreographed and it doesn't come by accident. And, and so, uh, you know, the rift between the U.S. and China that's something that he has planned to do. And yeah. somehow he thinks it's beneficial for us. Right. I mean, uh, as, you, as we... I mean, it's clear that his appointment of Peter Navarro, uh, head, head of this trade council mm -hmm. in, uh, in the White House. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, have you... Peter Navarro uh, is a econ economist, Harvard-educated economist, teaches at University of California, Irvine. And he believes that uh, the Chinese intervening in the currency markets are directly to subsidize exports. And they act with non-tariff barriers and a range of measures to inhibit imports. And he even produced a video, it's quite popular now, called Death by China, where he stab, where someone stabs a knife in the middle of the U.S. and the blood runs. <laughs> okay, that's incendiary. <laughs> yes, so he is the guy on this, and so... They're going to have to balance this question of can they move China into a trade position that's more favorable without blowing up the whole relationship on yeah. trade. And, you know, people like to go to the Walmart and buy their 75-inch TVs for $2,000. That will be really difficult. It won't happen anymore. But to talk about going to Walmart, I think Trump is going to the wall. I think that, was his, that has been his technique in real estate in New York. Um, that's his negotiating style. That's his style on The Apprentice. You go to the wall, you push the other guy just as far as you can push him, and you win by intimidation. And yeah. the question is whether Xi Jinping is capable of being intimidated. And for one, I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think so, he's but not going to be intimidated. Trump is very transactional. He doesn't really have a you know, sort of Ronald Reagan ideology of tear down, tear down that wall. I don't think he thinks of the world that way. He just sees it as a series of transactions. Yeah. And back, so he's not going to have a personal grudge. Back to coal for a minute. Yeah. Can, can we do coal economically? Um, you know, because actually, you know, there are dangers in the mines. It's going to cost a lot of money to make the mines really sustainable. Um, yes, can the, coal yeah. operators actually make a buck going forward? Can we, you know, uh, produce all the coal he wants to produce? So the, the first, I saw a very interesting presentation by Peabody Coal a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they had a big event in Washington with all the, what you would call the climate deniers, but let's say the climate skeptics. Okay. And uh, actually, I don't know that you can grow the coal market all that much, but you can probably prevent it from declining much further or declining dramatically. And even now, natural gas prices have started to move up. They're moving up out of, two, out of the 280 range to the 330 range. You start getting natural gas prices at 350, and the, you know, the service operators that do the interchange, you know, and the utility system in the US, they dispatch the cheapest power. There's all this talk about wind and solar and all that stuff, but if it's not the cheapest power and they need dispatchable power, they will dispatch the coal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it depends what happens with gas prices. And gas prices appear to be moving up a bit. Why are gas prices moving up? I mean, there's two reasons. One is more and more the utility sector is using gas. Exports of gas are starting to expand. We're now, ex we're now exporting about three and a half billion cubic feet a month, a day, to Mexico. And that gas is backing out oil-fired capacity and very inefficient capacity. 
So it's, from the global point of view, it's a good thing. Yeah. On, on, on Hawaii now, you know, I, I mentioned before the show began that on Friday, uh, the utility Hawaiian Electric um, submitted a, at the request of the Public Utilities Commission uh, a power supply improvement plan. And in that plan, after LNG has been hanging, I should say hanging fire, I suppose, that would be a bad pun. Uh, LNG has been hanging for, I don't know, three, four, five years as a decision uh, that, you know, was never made. Uh, just a, a possibility that was should have been decided or could have been decided. So now the utility has said we're not going to pursue that anymore. So and the and the PUC is not likely to raise that on their own motion, um, and, and it's not not clear that anybody will actually pursue that anymore. So it looks like at least for the moment that LNG is off the table. So here's my early forecast. We're going to get to them at the end of the show. Hawaii will be using oil-fired electricity generation for the next five years, and it will probably not decline at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're a real optimist, aren't you? <laughs> not an optimist, I'm just telling you. <laughs> it can be like your dentist. I'm just telling you you need a root canal. I'm not telling you it's a good idea. <laughs> well, using fossil fuel for the next five years sounds like a root canal, actually. <laughs> that's that's a loop, pull your AC. <laughs> I'm not the policy guy. I'm just looking at the uh, at what people are doing, and I'm saying, you know, you can live in a dream world, but <laughs> a market realities will uh, I love these conversations. That's Lou Pugliarese. Uh, he is uh, the, the president of EPRINC, which is an energy energy policy uh, think tank in Washington, Washington D.C. He joins us every couple of weeks on energy in America. And today we're talking about building up to the inauguration in energy. We'll take a one-minute break. We'll be right back. Wait there. Aloha. My name is John Waihe'e. And I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to talk story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Waihe'e. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. Okay, we're here on Energy in America with Lou Pugliarese of EPRINC, an energy policy think tank in Washington, D.C. He joins us uh, by Skype. We're talking about building up to the inauguration. We've covered uh, the issue about the midnight rules that President Obama issued and what they might mean. And now we're going to cover the second issue, and that is what, what is uh, Mr. Abe up to in Japan? Yeah, so let's, do, let's start with a little background on this. So the Japanese uh, uh, political establishment, Abe personally, burned a lot of political capital for the TPP. So, you know, we hear these discussions about trade and that it's one way, but, you know, political leadership in Japan had to take a lot of heat to get the TPP because they had to agree to certain adjustments in their agricultural policy. And like in all countries, farmers have a lot of power. And they have a lot of power in Japan, particularly the rice farmers and then the cattle, you know, the cattle ranchers. And so... Uh, Abe got pre-approval for all of this stuff. He took the political heat and thinking the TPP would go forward since it was an Obama initiative. But the, uh, the campaign itself, both the Democrats and the Republicans sort of threw that in the trash can saying, oh, it's terrible, the TPP is just as bad as NAFTA and all these other... I actually don't believe that, but that's what happened. We just can't control it. So I think Abe, he's pretty fast on his feet, was thinking, okay, remember, he was, I believe, the first like major leader to visit Trump after he was elected. He went to New York and met with him. He's now showed up in your hometown at Pearl Harbor. Oh, sure. Which is at a very visible kind of somber ceremony. Yes. Quite unbelievable for a Japanese leader. Yes. And now I have it on very good authority that the Japanese uh, will be proposing a major initiative to kind of 
to a kind of energy TPP, if you like. And it's my, you know, my sources are telling me that uh, Abe will probably meet with Trump sometime in late January, maybe as early as January 27. At that point, you know, one of the things the Japanese are preoccupied with is China. And they saw the TPP as a strategic counterweight. It wasn't just the trade. It was the binding of these, these uh, rapidly growing de democratic economies in the Pacific Rim with the United States, with kind of Japan as the centerpiece of it. Mm -hmm. And so Abe, I believe, will be proposing to Trump that Japan help him with his initiative to lift up the North American petroleum renaissance, particularly the natural gas production. And the Japanese will be proposing soft money, loans, uh, direct initiatives to help major Pacific Rim countries get into position to import U.S. LNG. I believe that if this comes to pass, which there's a pretty good chance for what I understand, that this will be embraced by Trump in a big way. And what this requires, by the way, is not just the U.S. selling LNG. We have to get more pipelines built in the U.S. We have to have a better regulatory structure to more to have more gas get connected. The large gas fields in the uh, Pennsylvania region now have to get uh, connected by pipeline to the Gulf Coast where the LNG exporting facilities are. Mm -hmm. So it could be a major uh, industrial renaissance in a way, both for Japanese companies would do these build outs in the Pacific Rim, but also for US producers. So I, I believe that this will happen and I believe that Trump will embrace it in a very big way. And it will have a strategic role for Japan as well. Yeah, this is a, that's major, and and yeah. so um, that, so if that if that happens, and um, you know they they come together on this infrastructure question and um, sort of transporting um, the LNG around Asia, yeah. uh, what what benefit is? I guess we have an economic benefit because we've we've uh, had a renaissance in uh, in fossil fuel. Um, and they have a benefit because they have made themselves what the uh, the channel, the pipeline, if you will, uh, yeah. for that fossil fuel all through Asia, and then of course that means uh, economic boost all over Japan. Yeah, and they will be backing out largely coal and oil. Right? It's dispatchable power. Mm -hmm. it might be backing up renewables in mm -hmm. some cases, but some so, of these countries like India, they need massive dispatchable power. And uh, if it can be done cost effectively, they'll be able to back out some coal. Mm -hmm. So Trump could claim, well, I don't really believe in climate, but this, but if you believe in climate, this is good for him. Yeah. So quit complaining. If this happens, how does China react? I mean, does China doesn't like it because it doesn't like direct relationships. China didn't like the TPP. Uh, is it going to like this better? No, they're not going to like this, but they won't be... They, they don't really have a good counter move to this. They could offer people coal, they could offer nuclear technology, but that's quite expensive these days. So I think this would be a very interesting initiative if it happens. And they might bring China to the table on a broader set of issues. But for the Japanese, I don't think they're worried about that. What they just want to know is that the U.S. is bound to them and bound to the major countries in the Pacific Rim. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, what's interesting is that China is out there in the Pacific Rim try, making loans, doing development, um, you know, trying to uh, help uh, underdeveloped countries become developed. Yeah. And they're doing it in every country you can think of. And here, Japan will, uh, will have uh, eclipsed them on energy. That'll be an interesting maneuver, and I, China will not like that. And as you say, there's not too much they can do about it. Yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting, you know, the Jap Japan, which has this really pacifist tradition since World War II, has had substantial increases in their defense budgets for the last three years. And there's another one coming, so. So you said that uh, you thought that this was, uh, you know, go this is exactly what uh, Abe was going to suggest to Trump on January 27th or thereabouts. I mean, how do we know that? Has that been in the, in the paper or is this it's just... Not, you, heard it, you heard it first here, Jay. Okay, I like scoops. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see soon enough, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> so it should get released soon. It should get released soon, is my guess. So, so looking at, uh, you know, the 
uh, power supply improvement plan I mentioned, uh, you know, submitted by the utility on Friday, and now under consideration by the PUC. Um, and uh, the fact that, you know, they took uh, LNG off the table. How could this affect Hawaii? Hawaii, but, which has tinkered with LNG for several years. So, so here's the actually interesting way this might affect Hawaii. If, in fact, we have a robust uh, transportation network, if you like, a seaborne pipeline of LNG moving around the, the Pacific Rim, there is very likely to be opportunity for uh, overs, you know, ships which have excess supplies or ships would have small volumes to stop on their way to India or Japan or Vietnam to drop off supplies in Hawaii. And there may be a, a unique market for the Hawaiians to get supplies at a very low cost mm. on a spot basis. Now, this wouldn't happen right away. It's going to take some time. But uh, that is, so my guess is that if that were the case, the utility or the city fathers of Oahu would have to take another look at this issue. Yeah. Because well, if we, as we talked many times, if we don't solve the storage problem, you're going to need dispatchable power. Yes. And it's right now, it's going to be oil. Yes. Well, yes. And you heard that here, too. And that's what you're going to be using. <laughs> Just wishing it not to be true isn't going to make it happen. <laughs> I don't care how much Aloha spirit you have, it's not going to make that problem go away. I remember root canal. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if the, if the Japanese put a ton of money into these ships, which are, are specialized ships carrying LNG, and they're big, expensive, you know, hundreds of millions of dollar ships, uh, and if they, you know, build, um, you know, a system of storage and distribution around Asia, uh, that's going to cost plenty of money. At the same time, you, you say that this, this whole initiative will likely reduce the price of LNG to the market. How does that work when you have to put that money in well, and you I still get a reduction in price? It's a limit how far it can go, but um, if you can, you know, get the economies of scale up high enough, you, you should be able to drive the cost to some... Look, it's not ever going to be the price at Henry Hub in the U.S. If it's three and a half dollars at Henry Hub, it has to be something more in the Pacific Rim. Sure. Seven or eight or nine, something like that, maybe ten. But that's actually not that bad if you can get a long-term deal at those prices. Yeah. And you have confidence that that supply will last for 20 years. Yeah. Well, on the question of, you know, lasting and supply and, and all that, it, it seems to me that if you provide uh, LNG all over Asia and, and the countries in Asia, the utilities in Asia all use it and, and they in turn, you know, build their plants to use it or modify their plants to use it, uh, then they're, they're going to be using more of it. And if yeah. they use more of it, then it's likely that the price, the price will go up over time. And so it's nice to lock it in for 20 years, but the, the spot market will probably increase well, as the use increases. Is, no? I do believe we are not reserve limited in the U.S. because we're producing from source well. And the technology for extraction keeps, keeps getting better. And lo so over long run, uh, average costs are falling. Um, if we can do certain things in the U.S. to allow this gas to evacuate to the markets from the main producing centers, which I believe will be given high attention by Governor Perry and Trump. I think we're going to see a lot of debate about the Federal Economic Energy Regulatory Commission and how we finance pipelines. Uh, what do we do about NIMBY problems? There's going to be just a, you know, a carnival of ideas <laughs> and, and debates. <laughs> Yeah, and not to mention that, uh, you know, when LNG has been discussed here, the big issue is can we, uh, can we accommodate big ships carrying large volumes of LNG? Um, you know, aside from paying for them, can we, do we have the facilities to, you know, offload them and all that uh, and store the LNG? So uh, if we were going to use it here, we'd have to re revisit those issues of infrastructure, yeah, yeah. and that would affect the local price anyway. Well, I think um, I think it's uh, this this meeting this meeting that we heard about here today, Lou. 
The meeting on January 27th between Messrs. Abe and Trump, uh, we'll be watching for that. Yeah, uh, watch for please. <laughs> 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 and it'd be very interesting to follow this. So thank you for helping us uh, build up to the inauguration and just beyond. And we'll, uh, we'll compare notes between then and now and certainly thereafter. And I so enjoy these conversations. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air to talk to you every other Wednesday. So happy, uh, happy Christmas retrospectively. Happy That's New Year prospectively. And if you need some inaugural ball tickets, just let me know, Jay. Yes, we'll... <laughs> We'll be calling you shortly about that. <laughs> Lou Pudiraci, the president of EPRINC, the Energy Policy Forum Think Tank in Washington, D.C., here in our show called Energy in America, Building Up to the Inauguration. We are so looking forward. Thank you so much, Lou.